When Energy Media readers, today we're going to talk about the energy transition in Alberta. As uh, regular readers will know, over the last four or five years, this has been a favorite topic of mine. But you know what? Uh, now we have some data to go uh, to accompany my uh, trenchant observations over in my columns. And I'd like to welcome Professor Melanie Thomas from the University of Calgary, who we're going to be talking to today. So welcome to the interview, Melanie. Hello, how are you? I'm just fine, thank you. So let's, now you did a survey of Albertans' attitudes towards the energy transition. Why don't you give us an overview of the study? So one of our main motivations for this particular project is to uh, broadly see where the um, opportunities and barriers for energy transition exist. And the first step on this is looking at the public opinion about this. One of the things that comes through really clearly if you look at the research around this is to quote from a study that was published in Nature Climate Change, uh, in many if not most countries, rapid progress towards a low carbon economy seems technically feasible, but politically impossible to finish the quote there. And so I think if your viewers um, or readers would think back to the federal election campaign, one of the things that came through really clearly was this idea from political elites in Alberta that transitioning away from oil and gas or specifically being anything other than a very enthusiastic cheerleader specifically for bitumen extraction uh, means that you were anti-Alberta. So this was um, a accusation that was leveled, I think, quite effectively against um, the Trudeau Liberals during the campaign. Uh, but it's also something that we've seen pretty consistently from Jason Kenney before even his own election and, and subsequent to this as well. So one of our big questions is how many Albertans actually see uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels as um, this kind of existential threat to the province? And our starting point was looking at something that was done by climate um, basically climate NGOs at this, this is idea of the Alberta Narratives Project. So if people Google the Alberta Narratives Project, they can come and they can see the public reports out of this. We one of the, for our purposes, we were comparing this project to academic research. So a lot of the academic research about public opinion and relating to climate, it will look at things like climate beliefs uh, and what makes people more or less likely to believe that anthropogenic climate change is a thing. They'll look at public attitudes about government intervention with particular climate policies, so carbon taxation or subsidies for renewables or things along those lines. Uh, but there's very few academic studies that actually look specifically at asking people about transition. And one of the assumptions is I think that people see the word transition as an existential threat. This is where the Alberta Narratives Project is interesting because they were, they clearly identified that in some of their groups when they're speaking to regular Albertans that some folks really do not like the word transition at all. But most people were pretty neutral about it. Um, they saw the idea that transition needed to be a gradual thing in the place that produces a lot of oil and gas. This isn't surprising. But one of the things that I found striking reading it myself was this idea that many people weren't threatened by the idea of transition, at least in the discussion group context, because uh, they didn't really see it as a change or a threat to the status quo. So transitioning to renewables is seen as a different thing than transitioning away from fossil fuels, specifically transitioning away from oil and gas. So the idea was kind of like, well, renewables are like nice to have, but like the fundamentals of our economy aren't going to change. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, that, now, I understand that, and, and, and Abacus Data is an Ottawa-based polling company that has done a lot of climate and uh, oil and gas and pipeline polling over the last uh, four or five years, and I, I thought that the data that you came out of your study was remarkably consistent with what Abacus has found. So, uh, and if I can summarize all of that, what it comes down to is that younger voters are more supportive of the climate change uh, mitigation and the energy transition. Uh, older voters are less supportive, and then conservative voters are much, much less supportive than, say, liberal and NDP, uh, Alberta Party kind of voters. Is, is, is that a fair observation? Sort of. <laughs> So uh, I would say that I'm a big fan of Abacus Data. Dave Coletto is a University of Calgary PhD, so we've got strong institutional connections there. Um, our data, I would draw slightly different conclusions from that, and the conclusions that I would draw would be that we see that things like age and other sociodemographic factors like, say, gender, uh, which consistently comes up in a lot of other research, they don't have very large effects. What has the bigger effect are um, 
people who, even working in oil and gas actually doesn't do nearly as much as people who are what we identify as economic conservatives, people who believe that uh, oil and gas will remain Alberta's um, most important industry, and people who are genuinely worried about climate change. So the conclusion that I would draw is that what forcefully structures how people think about energy transition are pre-existing values and beliefs about, say, the political system in general or about the market in general, uh, as opposed to more political kinds of variables. This is not to say that like being um, on the left or on the right doesn't do stuff, it does, or being a UCP supporter versus a New Democrat supporter provincially, like these things matter too, but the, the scope of the effect or the magnitude of the effect, at least in our data, um, are, uh, they're much smaller compared to some of the attitudinal stuff. I will say though, because people will want the caveats on the data, we have a big robust sample, which is good, but our sample is from Albertans who took the vote compass. And so this means that they are, there are a few things that makes the sample less representative than Albertans as a whole. Uh, our sample is more middle-aged, so we're way more likely to have people who are between 25 and 65, but we've got fewer people who are younger and a lot fewer people who are older. And our sample is much more likely to be uh, university educated than the Alberta population. But beyond that, we still have like 26% of our sample reports that they work in oil and gas. And so for me, I think we can generalize to the kind of Albertan who would take the vote compass. And this is also a key demographic. This is a group that isn't supportive of something like transition, the transition absolutely is not going to happen, right? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for people who are wondering, we looked at the whole battery of sociodemographics if people had experiences with natural disaster, political attitudes, we have good measures of Wexit and good measures of climate attitudes. So we've got the whole kit and caboodle in, in, our, in our models. Now, getting back to the abacus data, uh, they've, uh, I think they've shown that even in Alberta, there's a fair amount of support for a, a long-term transition away from oil and gas. It's not 100% by any stretch, but you know, there's more than you would, you would think. And uh, did your survey uncover any of those, oh, I didn't, I wouldn't have guessed that kind of conclusions? Uh, our survey broadly supports uh, the idea that a supermajority of Albertans support energy transition. And so some people might be surprised by this, especially because it is really easy to assume, especially based on, say, elite rhetoric, that Albertans want to double and triple down on oil and gas, uh, or they aren't interested in things like renewable energy. So we asked questions like, Alberta should move towards renewable sources of energy. And we asked participants to strongly agree through strongly disagree with these kinds of statements. 87% uh, of our sample uh, agrees that Alberta should move towards renewable sources of energy, 87%. And so at that point, there, are, there aren't, like, we would say that this is a ceiling effect. I can't find many factors beyond being really worried about climate change that makes people more enthusiastic about renewables. And one of the things that's interesting is that when you look at, say, the market for renewables, um, there's evidence to suggest that hearing about how good renewables are for making money makes people even more supportive of them, right? Um, one of the other things that comes through our data, though, is that uh, public opinion isn't consistent. And I think this is another thing that people assume that everybody will have consistent beliefs and give consistent answers on these questions. And as somebody who studies political behavior and public opinion, I would say no, expect some inconsistencies. So 59% of Albertans in our data agree that we should move away from oil and gas. We specifically said we should move away from oil and gas, but 49% um, agree that we should expand our oil and gas industry. So you can see that we've got, like some people are saying, yes, we should move away from oil and gas, but we should also expand our oil and gas industry, which is completely inconsistent. Uh, but overall, I would say that we have, um, for the indicators that we used and people's agreement with ideas, uh, overall, I would say that we have super majority support in Alberta for energy transition towards renewables. Now, again, this will seem perplexing to some folks. And so the hypothesis that we have coming from these data that we want to test further uh, in, in new studies is to assess how much of this is due to a complete lack of emotional investment in things like coal. Like Albertans don't see their fossil fuel identity tied to electricity generation in coal, for example. So when we asked about where people wanted their electricity generated from, people are enthusiastic about renewables like solar and wind. 
Uh, and like, it's, they really don't want coal. By 2050, our people, like on average, people said they wanted 4% of their electricity generated from coal compared to the 49% that it is now. And they had that 49% figure in the question, so they knew what the benchmark was. So I would say people are, oh, they're interested in that kind of renewable transition, particularly with respect to electricity. Um, but we also think that we didn't really capture the kind of emotional investment kind of like this Alberta mythology. And so one of the things that we're gonna test is to see whether or not some of that inconsistent, inconsistent, inconsistency sorry, comes from uh, different ways of thinking about particular parts of the energy sector, say. Well, let's talk about how Albertans uh, uh, talk about uh, the energy transition. And this is particularly, I think, germane uh, this week because last week we had the Value of Alberta uh, conference in right. Calgary, which was basically an oil and gas pipeline love fest. And uh, so what, um, what did your data say about how people think and t or how they talk about it? Well, we don't, because it was an online survey, we don't have a lot of conversation coming back and forth, but we did leave an open-ended comment section on the survey. We always end our surveys with this if people have ideas or insights that they would like to share, or if they particularly liked or disliked some of the questions that we asked. And one of the things that's interesting going through these comments, it's a kind of uh, people, who, when they feel really strongly, they will let you know about things. And so some folks found that even asking about this stuff in this way, which is, like I say, it's scientific, it's verified, we're replicating measures that are used in election studies internationally, things along these lines. Um, some people find like the idea of even raising these questions to be traitorous. Uh, these were certainly voices that were in the minority in our data, and I think that they are in the minority in the population in general, but they are very loud and they are very, um, I mean, some of the comments we got were downright vicious, which is fine, like as people's prerogative to tell us we do invite what they actually think but when I see conferences like this what I see is an elite apparatus that's supporting a very loud uh, but very angry but very small minority and so one of the things I'm seeing uh, in these data is that there are a lot of people who are um, thinking very differently and they are certainly quieter which means that they are underrepresented in terms of like the actual proportion of folks that actually think that way. So one of the things that struck me as a reporter who covers the energy transition and does so both nationally and internationally is the extent that over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, I would say, the energy transition has entered the popular lexicon. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's talking about it now. It's, you know, we, we, whether it's um, the BlackRock $7 trillion asset management fund or it's the International Energy Agency, Everybody acknowledges that we're in an energy transition mm -hmm. from fossil fuels to uh, low carbon uh, technologies, except Alberta. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me very much of the conversation one might have in, say, West Texas, around the Permian Basin, around the Midland Odessa area. It's culturally very similar in, in some ways to, to Alberta, but really out of step, it seems to me, with other parts of the world and even uh, the national conversation. Is that a fair comment? I think so. And for me, the most uh, interesting finding from a results perspective and then also the most alarming finding from a what, what does this all mean perspective is the really strong effects that we see when people self-identify as economic conservatives. So to identify somebody as an economic conservative, we ask four questions. One is that everybody benefits when business makes a lot of money. One, that the private sector, um, the government should leave it entirely up to the private sector to create jobs. One is the idea that government has a responsibility in redistributing income. And one is the idea that the economy or the environment should take precedence over the economy. So these are agree and disagree questions. And people who are paying attention will know that for two of those questions, if you agree with them, that's consistent with being an economic or a market conservative. And with two of them, if you disagree, that's consistent with being an economic or a market conservative. So we make sure that everything is uh, presented in the correct direction and then see how this affects those questions about transition that we were asking. Uh, and it's consistently our strongest negative predictor. So market conservatives or what we identify as economic conservatives are the most opposed to um, 
the idea of energy transition in Alberta. And what's interesting is that when we were looking at this, I remember thinking, what's going on? Because my read of the international market, so I'll go to international conferences and they will include in with the academic research, they'll bring in hedge funds uh, and investment bankers, a, a whole boatload of them, that talk about how they're going to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And so I see a lot of economic pressure internationally that says, get the show on the road with the transition because your ability to make money will be compromised coming out of this. And on some level, I think I naively assume that economic conservatives are entrepreneurial and part of that means is that they just want to make a lot of money. And so from that perspective, I find the results that we're getting from Alberta really weird. One of the things that we did because we've got those four questions and I said, okay, so say this is about like attitudes about the environment. What happens if I take that question about the environment being more important than the economy out of my measure of economic conservatism? So it's just about everybody benefiting when business does well. It's just about private enterprise should be creating jobs, not government, and that the government should stay out of income redistribution. It's still my most important negative predictor of opposition to transition. And so one of the things that we need to do in the next steps of our study is to, I think, refine this measure of, which is, because of course my first question is whether or not I'm actually getting at economic conservatism. This is a standard measure that we use, but, so I don't know how much of this I need more evidence before I say that like the Alberta business is in a myopic bubble and that they're not picking up on um, cues from the international market to their detriment. But the evidence, at least in a preliminary stage, strongly points in that direction. Like I say, we will we'll measure this. And one of the plans that we have, we'll measure this in different ways. And one of the plans that we do have is to, with our next data collection, to compare, to replicate what we found in Alberta and that because that will give us greater confidence in our confidence in our results, but also compared to other Canadians, because I get the impression that while downtown Calgary very likely could be in this bubble, especially about um, the energy business, I don't think that Bay Street is. And so if we get a distinct difference between those two corporate headquarters in Calgary in, in Canada, rather, I think that that will can give me more confidence in being able to say that this is a, a market bubble that's myopic and um, I think really missing the point that if folk want to keep making money, that the transition is the best way to do that. Well, Melody, uh, any final thoughts on uh, your survey? Anything we, uh, we should have talked about that we haven't talked about? So one of the things I always say about public opinion in Alberta um, is that we are not nearly as, we are not the stereotypes that we're presented as. Uh, and the other thing that comes through clearly when we look at this is that Alberta is often not very different than other parts of Canada. And so even on our economic conservative measure, um, our average is like, we don't even hit like the, the halfway, like I'm halfway economic conservative. We're on the like economic not conservative <laughs> side of the spectrum, even in Alberta, right? And so... One of the things, we've spoken a little bit about this before, but one of the things I see when we compare the kind of discourse that floats around about this stuff to the actual measures of public opinion that we have, is that even though there isn't a lot of disagreement um, between Albertans and, say, other Canadians, and that even though Albertans are consistently moderate, if not tilting, um, I mean, sometimes we tip to the conser conservative side of things, but usually we're moderate or even on the left side. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean much in a context where people have a social identification with their political party. So two things I want people to like forcefully bear in mind that the differences that are informing things like Western alienation or regional alienation and this like Wexit stuff that seems to have simmered down but like could easily be picked up again. Um, this isn't actually about substantial policy. And I know that you're gonna get comments of some people saying, yes, yes it is, but I would need much different systematic evidence in order for me to academically endorse that conclusion. But what I do see, and there's really good research from the United States about this, and we've got um, an increasing batch of evidence from Canada that people can agree on a policy, but if they are in different partisan camps, they just want to beat the other side, even if beating the other side means that we end up with a policy context that makes everybody worse off. Literally, people would rather just win on the partisan side of things than work together to achieve the goal that they both know that they share. And so what I continue to see in the Alberta context is um, partisanship as a social identity that's being used as the primary motive for a lot of the stuff that we're seeing here. And I think it's, it's obviously to our detriment, um, but I also think that that's being used as cover to say that there's genuine differences in public opinion when I actually don't have evidence to show that that's necessarily the case. 
Professor Thomas, thank you. Uh, insightful and interesting as always. We look forward to our next chat. Thank you very much for this. Thanks for having me.